And it's just a huge, huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Stanley F. Malamed, DDS, dentist, anesthesiologist, emeritus professor of dentistry at the Herman Ostro School of Dentistry of USC, formerly the University of Southern California School of Dentistry. He is a dentist, anesthesiologist, and emeritus professor of dentistry. He is author of three textbooks that we probably all read, Handbook of Local Anesthesia, Medical Emergencies in the Dental Office, and Sedation, A Guide to the Patient Management. Dr. Malamed has authored more than 160 papers in scientific journals and authored 15 chapters of other textbooks. Additionally, Dr. Malamed has authored interactive videos, DVDs on local anesthetic technique, emergency medicine. You know... Um, Seriously, Stan, I, I and and happy birthday. Today's your birthday, man, and you're celebrating it with me on a podcast. Is this just going to be your most amazing birthday ever? It is absolutely the best birthday I've ever had. <laughs> you know, if you go into implants, there's several legends. There's Brandmark. There's Mesh. You go into several uh, categories, all the nine specialties, there's several people at the top. But my God, in dental anesthesia, you, you own the whole space. It's just you. You're the judge jury and the executioner in the in the entire field and i gotta congratulate you i mean that, that that's amazing and in fact um i mean gosh i mean you, there was first horace wells then there was william thomas uh, horace wells with the uh pioneer of the use of anesthesia nitrous oxide then there was william thomas green morton in 1819 uh first guy that dentist used ether and then uh alfred einhorn came out with procaine in 1905 1905 <clears throat> I think the only name that w- they will ever mention for the, your entire lifetime will just be Stanley F. Malamed. I mean, kudos to you, buddy. How's that feel? Feels good. <laughs> and, and I don't want to uh, bring up any old dead horses, but um, I remember when uh, Septicane came out, you know, a couple of people said it was paresthesia, right. and they keep beating that horse for 10 years. But I always notice one thing. When anybody entered the debate, they only quoted you. And I hate to ask that question again, because it's 10 years old, but they still talk about that on social media all the time. What, what's the definitive thought on Septicane? Oh, okay. My opinion. And I'm, I'm, let me just, as a proviso, it's a disclaimer. I'm a consultant, Septidon, who make Septicane. Now, having said that, okay, I try to be as unbiased as I can. And I, I have been in my career. And I'll tell you right now that Articane, Articane, brand, uh, the generic name Articane, was introduced in the States in June of 2000, talking about 18 years ago, okay? It is now the number two most used local anesthetic in dentistry in this country. It is number two in the world. Over 600 million cartridges of Articane are sold annually. 600 million? Now, yeah. Well, worldwide, there are almost 2 billion dental cartridges manufactured every year. The number one drug is lidocaine, about 1 billion cartridges. Articane is number two at 600 million. Okay, now, the question about paresthesia. It, it's been around since before, a little before 2000, and there is no definitive evidence whatsoever that there is a higher risk of paresthesia with articane than other local anesthetics. Uh, if you want to look at sheer numbers annually in the United States as to the number of cases of paresthesia reported, number one is lidocaine. Well, lidocaine is number one drug used in the United States, so you expect to see that. But there's no – all the reports are anecdotal, case reports in the literature. And, in fact, it became a cottage industry in, in medical legal areas where plaintiff attorneys were online. Uh, there was one website called – lingualnervedamage.com. They were trolling for people. You know, I've been involved in probably 30 to 40 medical legal cases as an expert witness defending Articane and knock on wood, but we win virtually all the cases. And there's very simple reasons for this. Number one, the most common cause of paresthesia, the most, the nerve that is most often affected when it comes to paresthesia is the lingual nerve. Okay, let's, let's talk about this. 90% 90% of all the cases of paresthesia that occur in our profession occur in the mandible. Half the work we do is in the maxillary arch, half is in the mandible. 90% of the cases of paresthesia occur in the mandible. Of those, between 70 and 90% only involve the lingual nerve. So let's look at this from a logical point of view. If you're giving, if a drug is neurotoxic, they're saying that articane is more neurotoxic than other local anesthetics. It damages nerves. 
why don't we see cases of paresthesia in the maxillary arch if the drug is neurotoxic, it damages nerves. Um, Articaine is now being used in medicine. There are no recorded cases of paresthesia outside the mouth. If it's neurotoxic, you'd expect to see paresthesia elsewhere in the body. In the mandible, when you're giving a mandibular, I'm going to use a generic term called mandibular block. When you're giving a mandibular block, you have 1.8 mLs of anesthetic in your cartridge. You're probably going to give the vast majority of that volume, maybe 1.4, 1.5 mLs, when you go down to bone for the inferior alveolar nerve. And you're going to give a little bit of anesthetic to get the lingual nerve. All right? If you're giving a lot for the inferior alveolar and a little bit for the lingual, you would expect to see a higher percentage of cases of paresthesia involving the lip and the chin, the inferior alveolar nerve. But 90% of the cases involve the lingual nerve. Okay, what is the most likely cause? Mechanical trauma, needle touching nerve. You know, and this is especially the case when the patient is getting, and I think every dentist who's given lots of IA blocks, mandibular blocks has had this happen. You're putting the needle in, patient jumps, you pull out, you ask him what happened, I felt an electric shock. Where? In my tongue. Okay, that is by far the most likely cause of the paresthesia. Uh, Again, there's no evidence whatsoever. Uh, If you do animal research, and, you know, it's not the same as human beings, but if you dissect out the mental nerve, this was done in Brazil, dissect out the mental nerve on rats, you you kill the rats, okay? Um, And if you expose the, the, the mental nerve to lidocaine, to articaine, and to epinephrine, Only the epinephrine is the one that produces the paresthesia. There's no evidence whatsoever. I mean, like I said, the drug is, dentists all over the world love the drug. It works, you know, it has, it diffuses through soft tissue better. You you don't miss as often. It's a preferred drug in pediatrics. It's a preferred drug with pregnant patients. It's a preferred drug if if a, a person is nursing. There are so many advantages to that medication, but there's no evidence whatsoever, none. Um, yeah, it, it's so funny how uh, fake news uh, can spread. They, what do they say? Fake news spreads around the world in one second, but the truth takes years to go back around. That not that great? That term never existed in how many years before Trump? Yeah, fake news. yeah. Never- and you know, and also you made a um, you made a deal. You said uh, you want to have a disclaimer that you're a consultant for Septicane. I I I I still throw That's Dennis not- under a bus yeah. for that because. It's an obsession only American dentists have. I mean, um, I, I could say the same thing to every American dentist. Well, I don't need any dentistry done. You just, you work for yourself. You're just selling me a crown or root canal. And when I go to Europe, when I go to the IDF meeting in Cologne, Germany, which I think is the greatest meeting in dentistry, it's every other year. The dentists there, they, well, they want to talk to the owner. They figure, well, hell, if you're the owner, you know more about this company than anybody in the world. But the Americans say, well, I'm not going to trust that guy. He's trying to sell it. I'm going to go talk to some dentist who doesn't know shit about this product and his feigny right. expertise right. and his, and they're experts in like a hundred different products. But the, but the, the Europeans are like, well, gosh, if, if, if you spent your whole life making this, you're, you're the guy I want to talk to. So it's, it, it just comes down to trust. I mean, I don't know why dentists um, think everybody should trust them selling dentistry, but they can't trust anybody selling the, the, all the uh, stuff that we need to do what we do. And yeah, and I, I've done that. I mean, uh, my dental office just turned 30 years old. And once a decade, I do that. I give a shot. They jump out of the chair and they're numb. And you, I, think, I think I've done it three times. The longest one lasts, it was feeling tingly for like a year before it was all gone. The other two were just like a month or two. Right. Most paresthesia goes away. You know, the treatment, of course, as you know, is tincture of time. The body heals itself. Oh, I, I think, like that. I've never heard that. Never, you never heard of tincture of time? No, that's awesome. And when somebody asks you where you get it, you say it's on the shelf next to elbow grease. <laughs> That is awesome. I never heard that. So, you know, I um, I almost don't know um, what, I mean, I always thought of you as local anesthesia, but you're as big in medical emergencies um, and sedation. I mean, you're really a, a triage of uh, local yeah. anesthesia, medical emergencies, sedations. How, how did you go from anesthesia to medical emergencies to sedation? Is that all, is that all in one category? It, well, let's put it like this. Um, we were, we're going to be talking about emergencies in theory. We're starting on local, but here's what happens. Uh, I did a survey in 1993. It was published in JADA. Uh, 4,000 dentists in North America and their experiences with medical emergencies in their office. So I had 4,300 dentists 
every state in this country, six provinces in Canada, and 94.9% of them said that at least on one occasion in my dental career, I had in my office a medical emergency. Now, the average career was 14 years, and I gave them a list of emergencies, and the total number of emergencies was over 30,000. So that worked out to be about seven emergencies per doctor over their 14-year career. Which, what does it mean? It means that you'd have one emergency every two years. Now, of those emergencies, fainting, syncope, was number one. It was over half of them. So that means that every four years, you would expect to have a medical emergency in the office that is other than fainting. Okay, so that, that, in other words, bottom line is stuff happens. Now, in the emergency list, we had number one by far fainting. Number two was angina, angina pectoris, chest pain. We had asthma, hyperventilation, the so-called epinephrine reaction, and seizures. Now, those emergencies are called stress-related. And what I use in my lecture is a, a good example, fainting, most common medical emergency. Happy people don't faint. Scared people faint. Got it? Okay. So sedation. If somebody's scared, sedate them. You know, right now, the docs people with, with oral halcyon triazolam, that's a big thing. Uh, I'm a firm believer that nitrous oxide should be available in every dental office. Uh, those are the two most common techniques that are used. But if you take away a patient's fear, Mr. Macho, the dude who's scared of getting an injection, is not going to faint. And an epileptic, when they're scared, see, an epileptic, when they're scared, can faint. An asthmatic can faint. A person with angina can faint but they're more likely to have a seizure or an asthmatic attack or chest pain. So take away the fear you're preventing medical emergencies. That's number one. Number two, the most common time when medical emergencies happened was during the injection. The most fearful thing that, you know, I give lectures to every specialty group except for one, orthodontics, because orthodontists never miss injections because they, how many, how often do they give them, right? But the point is, uh, you, you can be an uh, implantologist, you can be uh, the best periodontist, pediatric dentist, oral surgeon, you've got to get good pain control. And that's, that is the starting point for everything we do in dentistry. I mean, you, you know, Dental Town covers everything. You guys, you've done podcasts with, I said, you said Joe Massad, you know, uh, prosthodontist, endodontist, but it starts with good pain control. And if you don't have good pain control, guess what? It hurts. I and mean, it hurts. Scared people faint. They can hyperventilate, asthmatics have asthmatic attacks, bad things happen. Now, the next part of this was that 22% of all the emergencies that occurred in my survey occurred during the dental treatment. So in other words, the patient, in, in, in the mind of a scared dental patient, the worst part of this whole procedure is the injection, the shot, use that term, okay? Uh, and, and, and the patient gets the injection, they get numb, and the patient, and it may believe it's a mandible, okay? And the lip is numb, the tongue is numb, and the patient is thinking to himself, and usually it's him, the, the, the fainter is usually a macho dude. The worst is over. I can relax now. So you pick up your handpiece, and let's say you're doing a restoration on tooth number 30, or you're doing an endo or an extraction. And I think you've all, in your practice, you probably had this also, where you have good lip and tongue signs, you start cutting on the tooth, and you get down to dentin, and the patient jumps, they feel pain. You know, soft tissue anesthesia, as we, we always, we, we know, is never a guarantee of pulpal. So what happens? The scared patient, the one who has bad pain control, poor pain control, medical emergency happens. So the two things that are tied into most medical emergencies are ignoring a patient's fear and not having good pain control. So that's that triage. In other words, the, the, tri the triad that we talked about, my book on sedation, my book on local anesthesia, good sedation, good pain control, and you're preventing a lot of the medical emergencies. In fact, if you add up the numbers, it comes out to be about three quarters of all the medical emergencies in dentistry are preventable by not ignoring a patient's fear and by having good pain control. That's nice. Um, again, I practice 30 years and I've, um, I'm really, really lucky. Less than one mile away from me is a fire department. And once every 10 years, I've had to call um, the fire department for a fainting. And um, one of the three times is actually my office manager. Sure. 10% in my survey, 10% of the emergencies occurred in non-patients. 
In other words, it might have been the parent or the grandparent in the waiting room and the dentist or the hygienist or the receptionist. Exactly. Yeah. I remember in dental school, my um, my best friend was saying I went in, in, uh, in oral surgery. And it was the first time he'd ever seen an extraction. Yeah. And I'm looking at the extraction. I'm watching it. And all of a sudden, I hear this thump. It felt like, it felt like oh, my God, a refrigerator fell over. And he's laying on the floor and um, um, busted up his teeth. Um, so, yeah. So, non-dentist. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. Not non-patients. Um, but you just, yep. Blood, blood, you know, blood scares a lot of people. Back to medical emergencies. Uh, and I'll sure. that back in a minute. Um, so w- w- what is your current assessment of how dentists are treating medical emergencies today? Well, the one thing that really blows my mind is like the case in Hawaii where the pediatric kid and they left her sitting up in a chair. I mean, it seems like every time, I mean, you, you see some of these cases, like, I mean, they didn't even do basic 101. It's like, are you kidding me? How did you get out of dental school and do that? Oh. Yeah, you know, I've been doing this for 44 years now, and you want to believe that you're making an impact. But I think one, of, you know, we teach our students CPR. Uh, in most dental schools, they have courses on medical emergencies. But and it's kind of a weird thing. It's good and bad. The good thing is that medical emergencies really are very rare in dentistry. That also makes it a problem in that you get. What's the word? You know, uh, you assume it's not going to happen. You get what, what's the word I'm trying to find? You assume it's not going to happen. So when it does happen and it ban, uh, people panic because, you know, it never happens. I, I heard about a story. You know, this is the dentist saying to his staff. I heard a story that Dr. Jones down the hall had a problem, medical problem last week. You know, I you know knock on wood, it doesn't happen here. But when it does happen here and you're not prepared, that's where does, that's the kind of thing in Hawaii where the disasters happen. I've been involved in cases like that, too, where a 16 year old girl got an injection from a dentist and fainted. And the dentist, well, she left the girl sitting up, you know, and got the ammonia, got the oxygen. But the girl was sitting up. And when eventually they called the paramedics, the girl wound up being brain dead. You know, I mean, it was a simple faint on a healthy 16 year old girl. And they did They did everything right except position the patient properly. You know, and I think one of the problems is that we don't see the good problem is we don't see medical emergencies, which also is a negative in the sense that we don't get practice in doing it. And a lot of dentists don't keep up with their uh, their training. And, you know, the the generals always say that the first casualty of war is the battle plan. And they really study the the reaction because they say when the first shots fired, 99 percent of the people dive in the. And, you know, dive behind a bunker and one guy will actually stand up and do the plan. So it's just kind of human nature. Probably 99% are going to panic. And, and I, I feel, I mean, I, I don't want to feel, um, I, I don't slight everything you're doing, but my, 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 most of my staff training is I just tell them all the time, we're 0.9 miles from a fire department. And whenever we call them, they're here in two minutes. So when I okay. first even, I said, if you ever even think something's going on, it's free. Just dial 911. We pay taxes. It won't cost us a penny. Hey, here's a fallacy to that. You're 0.9 miles away if that fire station is not out doing something already. What if they're, what if they're on, a, on a fire call and the station's empty? Where's your backup station? How far away is it? Uh, you know? it'd be, yeah, four miles. The USC School of Dentistry uh, is directly across the street from a fire station. And that fire station, we call 911, that fire station across the street from our dental school is not our station. Our fire station is about five miles away. So that station that's right across the street doesn't respond to us. So you, you make these assumptions that I'm only 0.9 miles away. You know, when I give my course on medical emergencies, like the name I give it is called 10 Minutes to Save a Life. And the reason for that 10 minutes is in the United States overall, if a person makes a 911 call. The ambulance will arrive on the scene in about 10 minutes. Some, in your case, it might be faster. Other, I, I give courses up in North Dakota. I give courses, you know, I won't say in the middle of nowhere, but quite honestly, in the middle of nowhere. And doctors have driven, you know, three and four and five hours to come to the course. And where they are, the, the ambulance will take 30, 40 minutes. So in other words, you can't make the assumption that everybody has an ambulance right around the corner because it's not the case. And the other thing is, um, I, I'm here in Las Vegas. You've probably been to Las Vegas. And, you know, I'm looking out at the Strip right now. 
Uh, you ever try to travel half a mile on, by car on a strip on a, uh, in the afternoon? You know, the ambulance is stuck in the same traffic that you are. So that's, again, the bottom line is train your staff. I mean, uh, there are four parts when I teach emergencies. There are four things I teach. Number one is the most important step in, in preparing for the office is basic life support, CPR training for everybody who works in the office. You know, most states make it the dentist and the hygienist and maybe the assistant. They're assuming that people who work chair side, okay, work with patients need to be trained. But I always give them the example, what if I, Stanley Malamud, come into the office at 7 o'clock in the morning, I'm a dentist, I come in at 7 o'clock in the morning, my first patient's at 7.30, and the only person in the office with me at 7 o'clock in the morning is my receptionist. And there's no state that requires the receptionist to be trained in CPR. If I, Dr. Malamud, who is good at doing CPR, if I have a cardiac arrest at seven o'clock in the morning and the only one there is my untrained receptionist, guess what? I'm dead. So one of the things I always teach is make it mandatory. Anybody who works in your dental office should be trained. Number one, the most important step. You know, number two is developing a team. People know what to do. Number three is having an emergency drug kit. And number four is basically how do you handle medical emergencies? But everybody, I mean, I, I would feel secure if I knew that everybody in my office could keep me alive. It's selfish, but you know what? I'm the old, well, I'm the old guy in the office. And I'm the one most likely to, to need it, the, the, the assistance. Yeah, I actually got a tattoo on my back that says, do not resuscitate. That's, <laughs> that's when you know your life's not doing too good. So I, I, tell us about your, um, your last book, uh, Medical Emergencies in the Dental Office. Uh, you're on your seventh edition. That is amazing. Yeah, that is amazing. I mean, I started writing these books back in 1978, and it's amazing. It's been uh, 40 years. Holy mackerel. I mean, yeah, the emergency book just came out, seventh edition. I'm doing the seventh right now of my local book, Local Anesthesia. I'm, I have six editions of my uh, of sedation book. I've been really fortunate, and they've been published in 39 different languages, too. So um, I've been very, very, you know, very fortunate. So this is Dentistry Uncensored. I don't like to talk about anything any, everyone agrees on. I like to go right for the juggler vein, sure. talk to controversy. Um, one of the biggest controversies in sedation is that um, in every city in America, in the hospital, I can't do the cardiovascular surgery and the anesthesia. They, they don't allow you to do the sedation okay. and the anesthesia. Britain, it was several years ago, and and. I don't know, it was five years, 10 years ago, was showing studies that, that, that the anesthesia as a specialist had a much higher survival rate after like a million um, people than oral surgeons. And, and so uh, why uh, do we see this? Why do, and Joan Rivers, remember New York, Joan Rivers, she didn't, she, um, so, my, so my question is, if it was my four children or my four grandchildren, I wouldn't let a doctor do the anesthesia and the surgery i would demand a board certified anesthesiologist um is that just unnecessary regulation that raises the cost of goods and services or do you agree no there is well in the united kingdom it's been almost 15 20 years where they you can't do both they had a what's called the pazwillow report but in the united states it, you call it the operator anesthetist now, what we're dealing with primarily is not sedation. We're dealing with general anesthesia. That's where the problems come in. If your patient, you know, nit look, nitrous oxide, Howard, right? Your patient is talking to you. There's no problem with the operator doing the dental procedure and that patient's conscious. Uh, the people who are using Halcyon, triazolam for oral sedation, there's no problem with that. We do intravenous sedation, which basically is the same level of sedation as nitrous oxide. In those three situations, there's no, the operator is the, and the word is not really the anesthetist for that person, it's the sedationist. When you get to general anesthesia, that's, where you, that's what we're talking about right now. And it is a controversy. And the only people who are really doing the operator anesthetist are the oral surgeons. You know, and, and they are a very powerful group. Uh, I, how do I say this? Uh, uh, you know, we had uh, many years ago, we tried to get dental anesthesiology as a recognized specialty. And it went through all the, the committees of the American Dental Association two and three and four times. And they agreed we should be at the House of Delegates. Each of the two or three times was voted down. 
And it was voted down because one specialty group spent a lot of money to have other people vote against it. So we, you know, we've given up on that. But again, it is a specialty. Dentist anesthesiologists, we are specialists. And they don't, they, they do the anesthesia and you do the dentistry. And we have a very good safety record. It's the other specialty, <laughs> which I won't say again, uh, that does the operator anesthetist. And that's where some of the disasters are happening. But, you know, I, I got a, I'm a dentist, but I also got an MBA from Arizona State University. And my oral surgeon, Dr. Greg Edmonds, 10 years ago brought in anesthesiologists just for workflow, right. productivity. I mean, a dentist doesn't do his hygienist. I can't believe dentists are afraid of dental therapists because as soon as they come out, they're all going to get a job at a dental office doing the fillings because the dentist doesn't want to do the cleanings or the fillings. And Greg Edmonds says, my God, I can take out so many more sets of wisdom teeth because I got a dental I got an anesthesiologist for 10 years doing all the anesthesia. You don't have to look, yeah. look, you go to the operating room, the anesthesiologist puts the patient to sleep. The surgeon walks in and goes to work. And, and we don't do that. You know, we, we for some perverse reason, we don't want to delegate. And I think delegating is good. I'd rather I'd re delegate everything if I could sit down and read a newspaper and have somebody do the work for me. But Yes, I mean, I'm here in Vegas and I have a couple of friends who are dentists and anesthesiologists who have been hired by oral surgeons. There's a progressive group of oral surgeons here, just like the one, Dr. Edmonds, you're talking about, that they will bring the anesthesia, the dentist anesthesiologist in, put their patients to sleep while that oral surgeon's finishing up the other patient, then walks into this room and can do the procedure. I, absolutely. It, it is. And it's so much safer. Because you can concentrate on doing the oral surgery while there's another person sitting there doing, keeping the patient alive. Basically, what we're doing is we're keeping the patient alive while you're operating on them. So, yeah. so do you think it is a good, uh, back to business, do you think it's a good business decision or a high-risk business decision for a general dentist to offer, uh, we can put you to sleep, uh, anesthesia. We, we offer general anesthesia, but the dentist doesn't do it. But he contracts because I'm, I'm in Phoenix where dentist anesthesiologists will come to your practice and, right. and do the, uh, the anesthesia. But but, you know, if you did say you did one case every Friday from age 25 to 65, I mean, that would be, you know, what, 50 cases a year over 40 years. Right. Um, do you think that that is um, like Joan Rivers? I mean, she went in for a simple procedure and died. And I'm sure but that, that was a that was what? That was a disaster, the whole thing. I mean, they should have, you know, I, I'm not sure what the rumors were that the anesthesiologist left or something. I mean, it was just. So, so that was just a, a perfect storm of stupidity. But, but, but yeah. back to the business decision. If, if, if a young kid just walked out of USC and, and they were going to have a business for 40 years, do you think the attractiveness to build your business by offering sedation and having a board certified anesthesiologist come into your practice whenever the case yeah. arises is a good thing? Or do you think that's yes. a high risk thing and you should stay away from that? No, no. no. So, number one, I think it's a good thing and it's not a high risk thing. And the reason is that we're treating patients who are medically fit. Uh, I don't know you, the, the, what we call the ASA one or ASA two. ASA one is a perfectly held ASA stands for American society of anesthesiologists. ASA stands for the American Society of Anesthesiologists, and it's a physical evaluation system. ASA-1 is a you review the history, uh, heart, lungs, liver, kidneys, central nervous system. They're healthy. ASA-1. ASA-2 has a mild medical problem. Those are the patients we do GA on. We don't treat the, the severely medically compromised because the risk is too great. Patients who are more medically compromised, you put them in the hospital. And you do general anesthesia. But when it comes to outpatient, it's the healthy patients we treat. And the age group you're talking about, anywhere, let's say, from teenagers on up to the 60s and even 70s, if they're ASA 1 and 2, they're very good risk patients. To have a separate, you know, have a dentist anesthesiologist there doing the anesthesia and having the dentist doing the dentistry, the, the, the risk rate is minimal. And plus, I, I have a bad bias of this because... When I got out of school 30 years ago, I mean, they were mostly sedating with narcotics. It took time for this stuff to wear off. Uh, the drugs right. today are just a lot more safer and reversible. Would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. The drugs, I mean, if you go back when I graduated dental school in 1969, some 10 years ahead of you, uh, more than that, 
Uh, the drugs we had were the barbiturates, things like Nebutal and Penethol, and even using them for sedation, the patient, when they would recover from sedation, would be groggy for the rest of the day. Now we have drugs like midazolam and you know, diazepam, but mainly di uh, midazolam, which used to have a brand name called Versed. Many people know, by, know it by that name. And it's a drug that's like Valium. It's a sedative, but it produces amnesia. So the patient, even though they're awake and talking the entire time during the procedure, has no memory of anything. So as far as your patient is concerned, they'll say, well, when I woke up, the first thing I remembered, but when they say I woke up, the implication was they think they were asleep, and they weren't. This is a, a sedation that's almost like nitrous oxide, where they're talking to you, but they have no memory. That's a marvelous medication, and the recovery from these drugs today is much faster. And we don't use narcotics as much anymore. We don't, because they're not really good sedative drugs. And when it, the narcotics are for, are for pain relief. But in dentistry, we have the best drugs in the world for pain relief. We have local anesthetics. It, it is weird because I've, I've had IV sedation uh, twice uh, for a colonoscopy, and uh, I have zero recollection of after. I mean, I, and in fact, in fact, here's the weirdest story. The first time afterwards we went and ate at the IHOP, I have no memory that we even went to the IHOP. Yeah. Well, you, got, you probably got that drug midazolam. Absolutely. Yeah. Because uh, my first colonoscopy was, I remember the nurse starting an IV and telling me, I'm going to give you five milligrams of the drug. Next thing I remembered is you can go home. Yeah. That's it. I had no record. Thank God. You don't want to have a recollection of what's going on when you're having colonoscopy. I know. I remember, and these, I remember when I had my first one, I said, uh, a man is about to go where no man has ever gone before. <laughs> hey, um, yeah. we always hear profanol in the news. I think it was because of Michael Pro Jack. Pro Pro Propofol. Propofol. Pro Pro -po yes, Propofol. Propofol because of Michael, Michael Jackson. I mean, he took that. No one yeah. ever heard of it. And now it's a household name. And I noticed that um, the, the anesthesiologist I was talking to said that as much as he loved Michael Jackson's music, he's still very upset about that deal because so many of his oh. patients – uh, or ask him, I don't want that. And <laughs> exactly. Well, you know, what happened, first of all, I mentioned, uh, you know, pentothal and, and drugs like that, the old barbiturates that are no longer used, the patient would wake up and be hung over for the rest of the day. Propofol is the new, it's not a barbiturate, but it's, it's the new drug like that. And it, it's a rapid acting, but short acting drug. So what happens is the patient, the term we use is the patient is street ready faster. They're ready to be discharged from the office more rapidly because they're mentally much more clear. Rather than having hours and hours of being hung over, they feel better rapidly. Now, the drug, again, what happened with Michael Jackson, and I forget the name of the, of the cardiologist, but he hired a cardiologist uh, who has no training in anesthesia to be his private physician. And the guy made lots of money with Michael Jackson. And Michael Jackson had a problem going to sleep. So he would give him propofol, which is a general anesthetic drug. You give him propofol intravenously at night so he, Michael Jackson could go to sleep. Well, on the night of the incident, and this is the equivalent of he gave him the IV drug, put him to sleep, and left. Well, you know, it's like an anesthesiologist. If an anesthesiologist walked into a surgery and put, it, put their patient to sleep and walked out of the room, the patient's going to die. Because the anesthesiologist's job is once that patient's asleep is to keep them alive, maintain an airway, monitor vital signs. So this guy, this, this, this cardiologist, and I, I already I have lots of slides to, I want to discuss propofol about this. He was legally allowed to use the drug because he's a physician. You can use any drug you want if you're a licensed dentist or, you know, or, or a physician. But he didn't have any training. And after after the death occurred, there was any anesthesiologist everywhere in this country, pro bono, for free, wanted to testify against this guy because he literally killed him. He, the, drug didn't, the drug is what killed him, but the person who killed him was the person who gave the drug because he had no idea what he was doing. Yeah, and the drug has a bad rap for that reason. It is known as the Michael Jackson drug, exactly. It's a great medication, super medication. It's one of the major disagreements between me and my 80-year-old mother. She thinks Frank Sinatra is the greatest singer-songwriter that ever lived, and I always tell her, no, Mom, it's Michael Jackson. Uh, my mother-in-law is 100 years old in four months, 
hundred and hundred years plus four months. Mentally sharp as anything, and Frankie is the guy. <laughs> I, Frankie yeah. is the guy. I am. And it's so funny you're from New York because everybody from the East Coast has uh, barbiturates and everybody from where I'm from in Kansas has barbiturates. Barbiturates. Uh, uh, barbit- What's that? Same drug. Same, 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 thing. same yep. drug, yeah. And also the Northeasterns call it hygienist, whereas in Kansas it's hygienist. Hygienist, yeah. Yeah. So you got, <laughs> um, you got three books and today uh, we pushed them out on uh, Dental Town uh facebook um we, we push them out on all the social media and but go through your three books who is your target audience for these three books you're talking to a lot of dentists say you got a book local anesthesia you got a book medical emergencies in the dental office and you got a book sedation a guide to patient management and they're all just covered with five-star reviews and the comments under them are you are the god of all three of those subjects so go through those three books and and tell my homies who should read them what they learn what they're about Okay, well, and, and the other reason would be to come take my lectures because I, I lecture on this stuff. But here's the thing. Local anesthesia is for the dentist and the hygienist. Huh? You know, very simple. Those are the ones who administer drugs. And there's so much new that's happening in local anesthesia. We have the nasal spray for maxillary. You know, no needles needed. Uh, we have a nasal spray to get maxillary, non-molar teeth numb. What's, we buffer- what's that company? Saint Saint something. Saint Renatus. Saint Renatus. Saint Renatus. Drug, Covenase is the name of the drug, and it, it's a nasal spray. Think about this: how many needle phobics there are. Yeah, you know, yeah, and, and they're it, always they're always the one with uh, tattoos all over their body. It, isn't that amazing? It, the people, <laughs> yeah. When when we do IV sedation and, and people faint, it's the tattoo person it, it's bizarre it really but when they got the tattoo they were probably stoned yeah so that might explain it right there but yeah the, the book on local is mainly for the people who use local uh the book on sedation obviously is for those people who use sedation uh which i i, I would hope would be every graduate from dental school because again nitrous oxide oxygen to me is the absolutely the, i call it the starter technique howard you know, that's what you learned it in dental school. You should be using it. Uh, and the book on medicine is for everybody. You want to get that entire staff trained. In fact, you know, when I, when I get invited to go to meetings, once a, once a year, most dental societies have a meeting for the entire office, local emergency medicine. You, you, the receptionists, the front office people, it, it's, it's designed for everybody. I think I've seen you at the Arizona State Dental Association meeting, what, I mean, several times, three times? Yeah. Yeah, multiple times. Yeah. Um, you um, you mentioned docs at the very beginning. Um, docs people. Um, is that a good program to learn sedation? Do you like that program? What What are your thoughts on docs? They're a big brand. Okay. Um, it's, 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 it's dentistry uncensored, buddy. I know. No, I know that. Okay. Here's the thing. Uh, they're teaching dentists to treat fearful patients, which is great. Love it. No problem at all, because there are a lot of dental phobics out there. So they're getting people into the office. And I think there's nothing wrong with that. They're using a drug, triazolam, halcyon. That's a very, very safe drug. OK, so so far, so good. But when it comes down to some of the things that are being taught, anybody like myself who teaches anesthesia have problems with some of the things they're teaching. And and yes, it's a safe drug when used properly. But, and I'm talking about, these are things I have been told, okay? This is not, they wouldn't put this in writing, but a quote such as, you can give a person a bowling ball size triazolam, halcyon, and it won't hurt them. No, people died from triazolam overdose. They, they They died from triazolam overdose from doctors who have taken the docs course because the doctors use it wrong. They don't understand the concept of you can't give, you know, there's a certain limit as to how much medication you can give. So, yes, they're doing a good job in getting dentists to treat fear. They're using a safe drug, but some of the concepts are a little bit against the, the, they're sort of not kosher. They're not up to par, if you will. So what training would you recommend? Well, number one, oral sedation as a technique is very, it's a crapshoot. And let, let's just talk about this. If the average dose of triazolam 
is 0.25 milligrams, okay? Why is it 0.25 milligrams? You, you've heard of the bell-shaped curve, normal distribution curve. If you gave 100 people 0.25 milligrams of triazolam, 70% of them would have the desired clinical effect. That's the middle of the bell-shaped curve. Uh, 15% of them on 0.25, that's not enough. Now, the problem with that is you gave the drug an hour before they come into the office and you gave them 0.25 and it didn't work. All right, what are you going to do? Give them another dose of the drug and wait another hour? Okay, that's a problem with oral medication. The other 15% on the other side of the bell-shaped curve, the so-called hyper-responder, 0.25 is way too much. And that patient comes in and they're overly sedated. They won't keep their mouth open. you, You can't treat that patient. So what I'm getting at is oral sedation, it's a crapshoot. You give a patient a dose and you cross your fingers and you hope the drug is going to work the way it's supposed to. Now, I've been talking about nitrous oxide as, your, you know, as a starter technique. With nitrous, since it works within 30 seconds, you titrate. You don't give everybody 40% nitrous oxide. You give them, you start out with 10%. You wait about 30 seconds to a minute. If it's not enough, you give them 10% more, 10% more. So you're giving everybody the amount that they need. You're not going to overdose. You're not going to underdose a patient. It's safe. And the same is true with IV sedation. People are afraid of IV sedation because they don't understand it. But with IV sedation, you titrate. You may need, Howard may need six milligrams of midazolam. Malamid may need three milligrams to get the same level of sedation. But if you titrate nitrous, you titrate IV, those are safe techniques. With oral sedation, it's a crapshoot. You give a drug, you cross your fingers, and you hope it's going to work. And that's, there's no safety involved in that at all. Podcasters are, are usually very young. Um, when I always tell my audience, shoot me an email, Howard at Dentaltown.com. Tell me uh, your name, how old you are, what country you live in. About 25% are in dental school. The rest are under 30. I get like one guy a week that says, uh, I'm 55, you know, two or whatever. Um, but anyway, um, I remember um, a lot of people are self-medicating. You know, marijuana was go to jail stuff when we were in school. But what what do you think about, um, I, I still think a lot of patients are not reporting to their dentist that they have a few belts of whiskey uh, before sure. they come. And now um, some people are getting stoned before they come. Um, yeah. what, what What kind of problem is that for these young kids? Well, okay, if a patient came in to, if I had a dental office, and a patient came in who was obviously under the influence of a drug, whether it's alcohol or whatever, I, would, I wouldn't treat them. I wouldn't treat them. Uh, basically, if they were definitely under the influence, in other words, sometimes you can't tell, but they definitely look like they're stoned or they're drunk. No. If that patient comes in with drugs in their body, and even with local anesthetics, even though there's minimal risk of what's called the drug-drug interaction. But if they come in stoned or, or high, I'm not going to treat them. Now, but what about the patient who you can't tell, right? I, I'm sure we've all treated patients who, who smoked a little marijuana or had a drink or two. Um, if you're using local, there's no problem. But when you start sedating patients, that's where the problem comes in. Because whether it's marijuana or alcohol, they're depressing the brain. And if you're sedating a patient, you're depressing the brain. All right, so let's go back to what I said a couple of minutes ago. If you are sedating, the pa- a patient comes in unbeknownst to you, has taken a pill or has taken a, a smoked a joint or has, uh, or has had a couple of shots of alcohol. If you titrate nitrous, titrate, it's okay. Because you're going to wind up at the same sedation level you would have been without having medication on board. But you're going to get there sooner. If you give IV sedation on that patient, you're going to, it's okay. You're titrating. But the problem comes in with oral sedation because you're going to give them the fixed dose of, let's say, 0.25. And 0.25 may have been okay for that patient if they hadn't taken whatever drug they took before. But if they took a drug earlier and they have a level of sedation already from that medication and you give them your 0.25, they could go too far. So again, a, t- a technique of sedation where you titrate nitrous intravenous would be safe. A technique like oral sedation where you can't titrate, you're giving a fixed dose, would be less safe. 
Simple. I'm going to ask a question that sounds kind of crazy, but I actually hear Dennis talking about that. Now that medical marijuana is being legalized and um, in fact, Canada is um, going to vote on it for the whole country in June. Um, some people are saying, um, would it be a smart deal to offer an edible to say, hey, are you afraid of the dentist? Come in my office 30 minutes before, eat a peanut butter cookie that's uh, or a marijuana brownie. Do you, th- do you think that's something we're going to see in the next uh, 5, 10, 20 years, or do you think that's a really bad idea? I really and truly believe we're going to see that in the future. And the reason is, number one, it's, it, I've, always, I've never had a problem with marijuana being legalized, never. Uh, you know, the, the problem with, with marijuana is the same problem that happened back in, 18, in, in the late 1700s with ether and nitrous oxide. Ether and nitrous were discovered around 1776. But Horace Wells, as you brought up earlier today, uh, didn't use it until 1844. But in that 70-year period, those two drugs were party drugs. Ether, frolics, people got high on nitrous. And when Horace Wells did his demonstration in Harvard University with nitrous oxide, he was laughed out of the room because how could this, first of all, in those days, the lowly dentist coming before the medical profession talk about nitrous oxide when these medical students in the audience had probably gone to a party yesterday and gotten high on it. So now what we're looking at in the year 2018 is we're saying, here's marijuana, which you know is a drug that people get high on. How can this drug possibly have any real therapeutic use? But it does. You know, It's been around for a long time for nausea when you have people on chemotherapy and they have nausea, it's been used for that. And, and it's a, it is a damn good sedative. And I think in the future, somewhere down the line, it's gonna happen, it has to happen. It'll be legalized everywhere eventually. And I think that yes, and, and doses right now can be strictly, uh, uh, you, you can dose it properly. You, you buy a marijuana brownie, so I'm winking now, as a, so I've been told, you know, uh, but it says on, on the label, uh, the dose of this is one fiftieth of the brownie. So in other words, if you can give a precise dose of a medication like that, whether it's a brownie or a cookie or whatever form of it you want, uh, yeah, I, I, have, I, would have, I would have no problem with it right now. Because I think it's it's a joke that it's it hasn't been used earlier for medical purposes. It's politics, you know. Yeah. Well, you know, when I was in college, I, I thought that the laws were exactly backwards. I, I all I remember in college is if the boys drink the hard stuff like Jack Daniels and vodka, there were yeah. fist fights, car wrecks, property sure. damage, police called. If they just drank beer, they wanted to go out and find women at the dance, so they wanted to go dance and find women. But if they smoked pot, they all stood home and ordered dominoes and watched movies. And I looked at all the mayhem after nine years of college and thought, man, they should they should illegalize liquor and hand out free marijuana every Friday at five o'clock just to control the university. Right. And you're more forward thinking. We are now. And 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 but people are coming around slowly. But you think about it. It's the coasts that start first. You know, here we go with the color of the, of the, of the states. But it's, it has to spread toward the middle of the country. And it's uh, much more conservative. I know. I mean, I was born and raised in Kansas. And, I mean, if they caught you, uh, my, um, I mean, I, if they caught you doing a DUI, it was like, well, you know, he's a country boy. But if they found a bag of weed, now you're like a prisoner and a criminal and – Locked exactly. up, and I mean, it was just crazy. Yeah, Horace yeah. Wells, I mean, he became addicted to that stuff. In fact, he actually died uh, from suicide when he was only 33. He committed suicide, absolutely. Yeah, these all, all the famous people in anesthesia. Horace Wells, you know, the father of anesthesia, uh, he became addicted to chloroform. He was arrested for throwing acid in the face of a prostitute, and he was put in jail. They allowed him to go home to get his shaving kit, came back to the jail. And under the influence of ether or chloroform, he slit his wrists. And then the guy who gave the first injection of a local was um, William Stewart Halstead, gave a mandibular block, a medical doctor, cocaine with epinephrine, became an addict to cocaine. And to get him off his cocaine addiction, this is like the year 1900, they gave him morphine. They didn't understand addiction. So, yeah, a lot of these famous people in anesthesiology were, in fact, drug addicts. And the reason is the way research was done in those days was on yourself. Right. You didn't, you didn't do studies like we did here today. 
you know, there was probably some poor sucker out there who uh, was experimenting with a thing called strychnine. We never heard of him before because the, the, the drug killed him. So the ones who picked the, the right drug, the lucky ones, are the ones who are famous. And who did Dr. Salk give the first polio vaccine to? To him, it was himself. Himself. Was it? Okay. And the next 10 were all of his grad students. The live virus. It was, a, it was a live attenuated virus. Yeah. Yeah, amazing. And, you know, when I got to school, it was a different time. I mean, um, you could buy um, – spray cocaine with people who had uh, oral surgery and they couldn't swallow and all oh. that. Cause I knew a dentist uh, back when I went to school, who was uh, when I was in dental school, an older guy who uh, was ordering that stuff. And he, he, he ordered it initially for patients who had uh, oral cancer surgery and tongues removed and all that stuff. The next thing you know, he was spraying that. I mean, it was 99.9% .9 pure aerosol yeah. cocaine. I mean um, yeah. So that's a uh, riddle with that. So what, you know, go ahead. If, if if cocaine weren't a Schedule One drug or two drug, whatever it is, uh, it is the best topical, absolutely the best. You know, and and it, it, it it's a great it numbs up soft tissue and it also vasoconstricts. It would be the ideal drug for for our intraoral, uh, you know, topical anesthetic. Unfortunately, it's cocaine. Ain't gonna happen. So it's just not gonna happen because the abuse potential is, is just too high. Oh, yeah, absolutely, yeah. But, you know, I'm forward thinking on the cocaine thing, too, because when you go to Latin America, what is America's number one problem? Obesity. And what was coca leaves used for? These long hikes, these long trails, they would chew coca leaves. And everybody in Peru that you talk to says that every fat person in America should be chewing coca leaves. And, but, and, and it would be just a tincture of cocaine. It wouldn't get you high or anything like that. Um, just like there's a little bit of caffeine in coffee, there's a little bit of caffeine in chocolate. But if there were just a little bit of cocaine in bubble gum, yep. it might. Uh, when you talk to dentists in Peru, they think it would make a major material impact on obesity in the United States. But because of the name cocaine, the, of course, the chance it's just not going to happen. Yeah, like I said, it's the same as marijuana. It has it has a stigma to it. Yeah. If it turned out to be a marvelous drug, it would never happen because the stigma against cocaine is so great. Absolutely. I'm with you, Howard. So I can't believe we just hit an hour, man. That is unbelievable. Is there anything I didn't ask that I should have asked? Not really. I mean, we sort of didn't go talk about medical emergencies most of the time, but that's all right. I think we covered local is really where you wanted to go. We covered sedation. We covered emergencies a little bit. No, there. I, I, I just want to make one, one final question because I know you're in Vegas. I know it's your birthday. You're with your wife. She's probably gambling. She's probably lost your house and car by now I'm while you were doing this interview. You probably I'm lost your pension, your 401k. Remember, what was that movie where the girl goes down and gambles and loses everything? That comedy. Do you remember that? Uh, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The million dollar proposition, I think it was, right? And she meets the rich guy, makes her a proposition, and they go to Hawaii. I can't think of the name of the movie, but um, yeah. But there's only three publicly traded dental offices in the world. Two are in Australia, one 300 Smiles and Pacific Dental, and the other one's in Singapore called Q&M. And I thought it was very amazing. Their lawyers, um, they are not, as a publicly traded entity, and Wall Street doesn't like risk and all this stuff, they will not do any anesthesia 18 and under, 65 and older. They say all the problems are 18 under, 65 or older. They don't want the liability of someone uh, like a pediatric dentist, someone uh, right. putting down a two-year-old kid and then it doesn't wake up, even though it was a board certified. You know, it all, So anyway, but they say, do you agree that all the accidents are under 18 and over 65? No. Uh, under 18. No, I mean, I could give you lists of patients who are in their 20s and 30s and 40s, but a lot of the cases are in younger children. We're talking about three, four, five, six-year-olds. The Hawaii case is one of those examples. Okay. Uh, Tucson had, uh, um, Yuma, Arizona had, has had two in the last five years. Really? Okay. But, but as I'm saying, but it's usually, 18 is too, is, is no, no, it has to be under that. Because 18, you're teenage already, they're, they're mature, there's no problem with that. But, you know, we always say that people who are under 6 and over 65 are at higher risk. You know, you give smaller doses of drugs, that bell-shaped curve thing again, okay? Under 6 and over 65 are patients who more, they tend to hyper-respond to medications. But again, if you go back to the sedation techniques, when you're titrating, it doesn't matter. If you titrate, 
then it, uh, you, you're going to wind up using less medication. If you, but if you're giving that 0.25 milligrams of triazolam to an 80-year-old, they're more likely to over-respond and be over-sedated. But I think that the numbers you gave me, 18 to 65, is too constricting. But I understand from their perspective, the risk perspective. Insurance companies or big companies, they don't want to have any risk. So, yeah, I, I, I understand that. I don't agree with it, but I understand it. Hey, um, you, uh, I, you know, when I was getting my FAGD, my MAGD, I um, mean, I've taken your, I've sat through your lecture so many times last 30 years. Um, uh, when I told my friends yesterday, my alcoholic dentist drinking buddies at the bar that today it was you, they were like, are you serious? And um, uh, thank you so much for all that you've done for dentistry. You're a legend. You're, you're the modern day Horace Wells. I hope you don't end up uh, in Vegas throwing uh, acid in some girl walking down the strip. Uh, but um, th seriously, thank you for all that you've done for dentistry. It was just a com complete honor to be able to podcast interview. Thank you so much for coming on the show. Howard, thanks a lot. And My pleasure. And don't lose all your money in Vegas. It may be too late, but thank you. <laughs>